Okay, so this is the last of the lectures on diffraction. And let me do what I meant to do last time, but the, the computer I had to switch to didn't quite do it, which is just to show a few frames from the video uh, where I actually went in the lab and, and took this. And I'll, I'll point out some things here that I might not have pointed out in the video. So let me see if I can, oops, share this one. Uh, okay, so the setup, the at least the first setup we consider in the lab is just a helium neon laser pointed at a very small circular aperture. And ideally the laser would be a uniform plane wave hitting this aperture. In reality, the laser is a little bit on the small side to, to make this um, a perfectly flat plane wave hitting it, but the, it, the uh, approximation that it is a plane wave works out pretty well, uh, at least qualitatively. Quantitatively, uh, the, the fits aren't perfect, but uh, in the inner region, it's, it's pretty perfect. So oops, let me go back. Um, so the laser hits, hits this tiny hole here, and I think it's about a 100 micron in radius hole. And then I let the, the laser beam propagate over this railing here to the end of the table. It goes close to two meters. And let me see. So there's the 100 micron hole. Here I'm holding up a piece of paper, but you can't see anything because the lighting was not quite right. And here it is hitting the detector on the other side. So this is a one millimeter hole. And you can see this pattern, sort of a, a bullseye pattern uh, a series of bright and dark fringes. The, the circles that surround it are, are getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. Um, normally when students take this data in the lab, they turn this micrometer and they measure how much light gets through that little hole on a voltmeter. Um, and that, that works out pretty well, but uh, I decided to, to give you data that's a little bit different because it helps with the kind of thinking in two dimensions. So here's, here's the other setup, which is the data you'll actually analyze. Same laser, same 100 micron radius pinhole. And now I have a camera with the lens off. And so I'm just going to directly uh, let the diffraction pattern hit, hit the camera. And I'm gonna, I took some pictures. And let me see. Here I'm talking. Let me see if I actually show the, oh no, now we're onto something else here. Uh, it must be the frame where I show the image. I'll just let the video play. Maybe I uh, maybe I switch to it at the very end of me talking here. Ah, uh, there we go. So this is this is actually what the camera sees, and uh, I, I took I took this image with many different exposures, and the the one where the so for the video. Um, I let the, the central spot saturate, uh, but for the actual data I, I took, I was careful not to let the central spot saturate the camera. So you, so you can actually see the central, central spot and the shape of the central spot, which is what you'll, what you'll fit, and, and the rings. And if I were to, to do measurements of the rings, they, they would appear at the right angles, uh, roughly of the right brightness. But uh, because the laser hitting the, the pinhole isn't perfectly uniform, the, the detailed fit is is a little bit off, so so the the fit is really good right right here in the central region. Uh, so that's that's what you'll fit for the homework. But this is the Fraunhofer diffraction pattern of uh, a tiny little uh, circular aperture, and we'll see today in today's lecture that the the pattern here is actually a Fourier transform of the the a circle. And, uh, and I'll show you the approximations that you need to, to establish that, the, that in the far field and for a very small source, the pattern you get is the Fourier transform of the, the pattern you start out with. So if you start off with a circular aperture uniformly illuminated by a plane wave and only a circle's worth of, of uniform uh, electric field gets through in the far field, that circle will turn into that, uh, that bullseye pattern. And uh, so let's, let's, let's do that. Let's, let's review where we started off last time, which was that uh, we saw that the 
the electric field, this is last time, electric field as a function of X and Y at our particular Z location where we put the screen, this was a convolution of two things. One was the uh, electric field at the uh, X, oops, X, Y at Z equals zero. And the other one was this, this thing called a Green's function uh, in a lot of physics classes and uh, some math, like partial differential equation type classes. It's called an impulse response in engineering. It's, uh, uh, what else? There was one other name that, that I just blanked on. It's the convolution of this with, with this, this thing that I'll, I'll label G. And G of X and Y. So the convolution is just an X and Y, but the parameter, uh, parameter of this function is Z. And, and let me just write what, what this, this G is first, and then I'll write out what, what this convolution actually means, and then we'll start doing some approximations. So G, this is the thing I calculated last time, G of X, Y, and Z. Well, this is K over two pi I Z. So remember K, K is two pi over lambda. So that's just a constant for a, something like a laser that basically has one wavelength. Uh, this falls off with Z. At the end of the day, we're mostly going to ignore overall phases because we don't actually measure the electric field. We measure the intensity, which is the magnitude squared of the electric field. So, so just think about this as some constant over Z. So the uh, as you get farther and farther away, the, this this is gonna the thing you get is gonna shrink in 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 uh, amplitude as one over z, or in intensity as one over z squared. And since things are mostly going forward, that's that's where you get your one over r squared uh, intensity fall off, which is pretty much what what always happens uh, for any uh, any optical setup. So that's the, the start of it. And then there's a, a pure phase factor, which is e to the i uh, k over two z times x squared plus y squared. So this is sort of the radial distance away plus i k z. And, and let me write out what this convolution is in a little bit more detail uh, before we actually jump into some approximations here. So, so e, e plus of x, y, z is, well, a convolution, you take this, this thing you're convolving with, the the electric field at z equals zero. And I'm gonna write it as x prime and y prime because what you're gonna do is you're gonna take, for, for every, every x prime and y prime, you're going to plunk down a Green's function. You're going to plunk down an impulse response and then add them all up. So if, if this had only, uh, only an electric field at the, at the very origin, you would just get g. But if you have a whole bunch of points or a continuum of points, you would plunk down a G at every X prime and Y prime and add them all up. And that's what the, the, that's what the convolution does. So here's the, the plunking, it, plunking it down. So you're, you're gonna shift, shift this, uh, this uh, response to, to where you're evaluating the, the source, Y minus Y prime Z. And this is just a two-dimensional convolution, just a convolution in X and Y. And then, uh, so, so this is a weighted sum of, of Gs shifted to the spot in the, uh, well, in our example, shifted to the spot on the circle where we're considering. And for the circle example, all the spots are, are equally weighted within the circle and have zero weights outside of the circle. So you just sort of copy and paste this G a continuous number of times all around the circle. And, uh, and that, that involves having to integrate from minus infinity to infinity all over the circle or all over the, uh, the uh, initial aperture and y prime. So this is quite a general setup here. Um, the, the simplest example I gave of a uniform field hitting a circle, that's, you know, that's, that's the very simplest thing you could do. You could have any field at all at z equals zero. And with this technique, you can ask, how does that field propagate forward? 
you could take any complicated mask you want, even a phase mask where there's just the glasses of different thickness and it delays the light uh, slightly different amounts. And if you shine a laser on that mask, um, this will tell you how to propagate it forward to an arbitrary Z distance. And one of the applications we're not going to discuss is, is holography. So if you make that mask sufficiently interesting and complicated enough, uh, you can mimic the, the light field that would come off of uh, objects as if they were illuminated by that laser. So the book discusses this a little bit, how you would set up a, a hologram and how you'd reconstruct a hologram. But uh, the, the idea is that the actual film of the hologram is a bunch of silver grains that are either exposed or unexposed and the laser hits it. And, um, and each one of those unexposed regions emits a wave that looks a lot like this. Uh, and when you add them all up, you, you can mimic any, any uh, arbitrary light field. And that's why it looks three-dimensional because if you're mimicking the actual light field that was emitted by a bunch of objects, then as your eyes are looking at it, it's, it's indistinguishable from the actual light field that would have been emitted by those, those objects. And what's interesting, but required by Maxwell's equations is you can encode all that information on a sheet at z equals zero. And that, that fully determines what, what happens at, at later z. Okay, so this is the general setup. Um, let's, uh, there was already one approximation that went into this, which was that we're, far, we're looking far away and at, uh, at small angles. So in my video, the, the light sh shone pretty much straightforward. Even the biggest, the largest rings you could see were you know, maybe a, on the order of a degree or two away from, from straight ahead. Now that was the first approximation we make. Uh, the second approximation we're gonna make is, is, the, is the following. So let me, maybe, maybe before I, uh, no, not, let me just, I, I said in words what, what I was gonna write in math. So, so let me just dive in and make this approximation. So the approximation is gonna come not in our initial field because that should still be whatever we want. The approximation is gonna come in this, in this greens function, this way of propagating the initial field forward. Ah, that's, the, that's the third thing. So it's either a greens function, impulse response, or sometimes called a propagator in the sort of more quantum -y kind of uh, language. You'll often hear this referred to as a propagator. Uh, it's just the thing you have to, you have to uh, take the weighted sum of for every, every source. And, and the approximation we're gonna make is, is the following. So, so here, let me just draw a picture. Here you have your laser hitting uh, a screen with a hole in it. So again, this is sort of the simplest case of, of the most general thing we could do. And then most of the laser gets blocked, but a little bit of it goes through and eventually hits a screen here. And that's, that's what we measure. Um, the thing we're integrating over here, dx prime and dy prime, the meaning of that is that is the location on the screen. So if I were to label this, the screen would be labeled x prime y prime. So you know, maybe y prime would go up and x prime would go uh, because it would come out of the board in order to make the right hand rule work. And what's what we're evaluating it, uh, uh, the, the final screen here is x, y at some z. So z is going to be this distance here. And the screen is going to have coordinates x, x and y without primes. And the second approximation we're gonna make is that this aperture here, this hole is small compared to X and Y. So um, and certainly that's the case for our setup with the laser. The hole was hundred microns in radius and the screen you saw uh, the one millimeter hole was already 10 times bigger than, uh, than this hole. But the whole, the whole screen or the camera you know, that's uh, on the order of a few centimeters. So that's for, for all the reasonable setups we're considered that that's, that's a pretty good approximation. Uh, and what does that translate into in math? Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna evaluate this G not at X and Y, but at X minus X prime and Y minus Y prime. So in this exponent, I'm gonna have terms that look like X 
minus x prime squared. And if I multiply this out, this is just x, x squared minus 2x x prime minus x prime squared. And the approximation we're going to make is we're going to ignore this last term compared to these other two. So um, you have to be a little bit careful here because it looks like you're integrating all the way out to infinity, right? You know, these integrals go all the way out to infinity. You say, well, how could this last term be ignored if, if it goes all the way out to infinity? Well, the idea is that if you have any, any screen that's of some finite size and it's small, then these integrals aren't really out to infinity. They're out to you know, the size of the source, what, 100 microns. Uh, and so as long as the x that you're evaluating at is, is a scale that's much larger, which is true of this screen, uh, you, can, you can ignore this, this last term. So that's the second approximation we're going to make. This is the Fraunhofer approximation. So this is approximately x squared minus 2x prime uh, x x prime, I guess, x x prime. And we still need to keep this term because uh, we need to integrate something. Right, if we if we just ignore this term, uh, if we if we didn't keep this term, then there would be no dependence on uh, on x prime, which is the thing we're integrating over. So we're sort of keeping keeping this to first non-trivial order. Uh, okay, so when when we do that, and we plug in, uh, so when we do that. Uh, let me just sort of describe in words what happens. So this x squared is going to, remember, we're evaluating it at x minus x prime. So this x squared is going to turn into an x squared minus 2x x prime, y squared similarly, you know, same, same style of approximation here. Um, in terms of being what's integrated over, the, the x here is, is not what's being integrated over. That's just a a parameter that we evaluate. That's the coordinates of the screen here. So this first term is actually going to come out of the integral. The second term is going to stay in the integral. Same thing for the y. And the z here, that, that's also not something we're integrating over. So that comes out. So a lot of stuff is going to come out of the integral when we do that. And let me just start at the top and, and write what you get after you plug this in and take everything that can be taken out of the integral out of the integral because it doesn't, doesn't depend on x prime and y prime, which are the coordinates of the, the, uh, the aperture at, at the origin, the thing we're shining a laser through. OK, so, so when I do that, let's see. The first, first terms we have, we have all this, these constants out here. So I just write e, e plus of x, y, and z. This is under the, the Fraunhofer. Uh, approximation now. So this approximately equals, let me just say under the Fraunhofer approximation, uh, this constant here. So k over 2 pi iz, where k is just uh, 2 pi over lambda. It's just a constant. So I could rewrite this in terms of lambdas. Uh, this last e to the i kz comes out, e to the i kz. Um, the terms involving just x and x squared and y squared here and not not this cross term, those also come out. So e to the i k over 2z x squared plus y squared, that all comes out. And what we're left with is the following. We have still integral minus infinity to infinity, dx prime, integral minus infinity to infinity, dy prime. And we still have this initial electric field equals zero. Oh, sorry, e plus uh, the complex part of the electric field, x prime, y prime, zero. Or sorry, the complex representation of the electric field. And and what's left over in this integral is are just these cross terms. So that is e to the. Let me write it uh, without sort of factoring things out. So e, this is e to the minus i k x over z x prime minus i k y 
over z y prime. And this thing here, the thing that's left in the integral, this is the Fourier transform, the two-dimensional Fourier transform of the aperture of the thing you're shining the laser through. It's just, it's a little bit hard to recognize because normally we call this coefficient k sub x and this coefficient k sub y. But if I were to, if I were to just take the Fourier transform of this, you know, either computationally or numerically or, or whatever, this would be the Fourier transform evaluated at kx equals k, the constant 2 pi over lambda times x over z, and k sub y, the plane wave component in the y direction, evaluated at k times y over z. Uh, okay, so and this uh, th also this stuff here. This is all pure, pure phase. So it doesn't doesn't affect the intensity. So at the end of the day, if we want to calculate the intensity of, of what we see, which is, unless you're, unless you're dealing with an interferometer, um, well, but let me just say, for optics, all you ever see is the intensity. All you can ever measure is the intensity. Um, if you're dealing with an interferometer, then you might need to keep some intermediate steps so that you can then add them together and then calculate the intensity. But for here, there's, there's, we're just measuring the intensity of this pattern. We're not trying to interfere it with some other related pattern. So when we calculate the intensity, we don't even need to worry about that. So the intensity of what we get out, which is you know, a simple constant times the magnitude squared of this, that's just this factor here that involves lambdas and z's and the magnitude of the Fourier transform of what you put in. So the, the factor here that involves lambdas and z's, that just says how, how much dimmer the pattern gets as you get further and further away. Uh, but the shape of the pattern is, is given by the Fourier transform of this. And notice that you're, you're evaluating the Fourier transform at some constant times x over z. And x over z is like the, the x angle and y over z is like the y angle of, of this. So, uh, so let, me, let me do that. I'm gonna erase, I guess I'll erase this because we're not gonna use it anymore. And the next line. And, and this, is, uh, this is another reason why studying Fourier transforms is, is useful in optics because whenever you shine light through anything, what you get out in the very far field is the Fourier transform of that thing. So getting a feel for two-dimensional Fourier transforms is, uh, is often pretty useful. Uh, okay, so yeah, let me actually write. Okay, so if we want to write the intensity as a function of x, y, and z, this is uh, two, two over eta, this, this thing in uh, uh, kind of has units of ohms, uh, ohms per meter uh, squared electric field which has units of volts per meter squared. And let me just write this out. So this is two over eta and the magnitude squared of all this stuff. So uh, with k equal two pi over lambda, I'm just gonna let the two pi's cancel here. I'm gonna write this as the, the magnitude of one over i lambda z, of course this i is gonna go away once we take this out of the magnitude squared. Uh, of, there's the Fourier transform where you evaluate the Fourier transform at kx equals, uh, let me write this as k times x over z. Uh, maybe I can even write, 
this is two pi over lambda times like the, basically the x angle and ky is evaluated at two pi over lambda times the y angle, y over z. So all of that magnitude squared gives us our uh, gives us our electric field. So let me just two over eta lambda z. So normally you don't care much about the, the constants here, this eta and lambda, that just gives the units of i correctly, um, knowing that, uh, sorry, this would be lambda squared z squared, knowing that this falls off like z squared, that's, that's useful. So if I go twice as far away, my intensity is gonna go down by a factor of four. The most important thing here is that it's the shape of it is the Fourier transform of the initial pattern evaluated at uh, certain, certain places. All that magnitude squared. Okay. Um, now, I would say that the, again, this is quite a general setup here. We can start with any, any aperture at all whether it be just a hole of a certain shape, those are kind of the easiest ones, or, uh, or uh, a more complicated pattern. Like if you had a, a photographic plate that was kind of had a, a spot in the center that was clear, but it got opaque like a Gaussian. So as, as you went farther and farther away from the center, the, the photographic plate would get more and more opaque in, in the manner of a Gaussian. Hopefully you remember from quantum or stat mech that the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is another Gaussian. And so what that means is if you shine a laser at a Gaussian shaped hole, you, you get out a, a Gaussian. Now that Gaussian is still gonna spread out at some angle, um, but you can calculate exactly uh, what, what that Gaussian is and you know, by taking the Fourier transform. And if you wanna know what, what do you mean by taking the Fourier transform? Well, that's, that's just this, you know, kind of written out more explicitly. That's, that's this thing uh, that I put the curly braces under. All right, so, so let's, let's do the example that's relevant for the lab, which is you know, maybe the second simplest one. I would say the simplest one is a square, a square aperture because there uh, you can do these integrals separately. But I would say the second most, second simplest example would be a circular aperture, where again, we can do these integrals analytically And that's what you will fit in the lab. You'll, you'll take my photograph of at least the central region and try to fit, fit that photograph. So let's I'll grab this color. Okay, so, so circular uh, aperture. Of radius, of radius a. All right. So of course, the first thing we want to do is we want to calculate the Fourier transform here, and then evaluate it at a certain kx and ky. So let me just write what the Fourier transform is for a generic kx, ky. That'll keep things a little simpler. So this is integrating from minus infinity to infinity. I'm going to drop the primes here since they're no longer really necessary. dx, you go from minus infinity to infinity, dy of e plus of x, y, 0, e to the minus i, kx, x, minus i, ky, y. And for our circular hole, this is gonna be one or at least some, some constant amplitude and constant phase for a radius less than A and it's gonna be zero for a radius bigger than A. Uh, and in order to do those, those kind of integrals, um, well, yeah, in order to do those kind of integrals, we wanna to switch, to, uh, switch to polar coordinates. So let me do that. And then we can do the integral and we'll have an expression that we can then fit 
our, our photograph of the diffraction pattern. Yes. Marker is harder to erase than the other one. Uh, any, any questions while I'm frantically erasing? All right, so switching to polar coordinates, uh, it's nothing, nothing new here. Our x, uh, I'll let this be r cos theta, y is r sine theta, dx dy is r dr d theta. Uh, maybe we should have, well, let me call these phi because we're in physics class, not math class. Cos phi, sine phi, d phi. Okay, um, and and I just have to rewrite rewrite this integral here. So I've got an integral uh, integral from zero to two pi d phi. That's sort of writing these infinite integrals dx dy in terms of r derivative theta. So here my my integral over r is only going to go from zero to a r dr, my electric field within this radius a, the whole point of a plane wave hitting this is that it's just some, some constant e naught. Um, and then the, the integral is e to the minus i kx. So this would be, you know, we should be able to evaluate this integral for any constant kx times x, which is r cos phi and uh, minus i ky r sine phi. Um, okay, so this integral looks pretty, pretty nasty, but if you ask Mathematica to do it, or if you look it up in a table of integrals, this, this has a, a name, it's a special function and this turns out to be a Bessel function. So uh, I can take my, my E naught out of the integral. And what I end up with left is two pi A over, let me call this kappa here, J1, the Bessel function of A times kappa. I'll tell you what kappa is in a second. So kappa, kappa, is just kx squared plus, or kappa squared is kx squared plus k phi squared. So it's just kind of like the, the radial component of the k vector. It's not, not, it's not two pi over lambda. That would be only if I included kz. So um, remember what we're gonna do is we're gonna evaluate this at some, where kx is some particular angle here, you know, some constant times the angle in the x direction for a small angle approximation and the constant times the angle in the y direction for a small angle approximation. So this, when you plug these things in, it basically works out to be the, uh, the angle away from the, uh, the origin. So if you, if you plug all this stuff in, uh, what you get here is k, k squared, the actual honest to God two pi over lambda squared times r squared over z squared. So that's plugging these two things in. And uh, uh, and I guess I could have written k squared as two pi over lambda squared. But uh, I think I think in the lab, I kept it as, as k squared for the fitting just because it's one, one, sin, single, uh, one single thing to fit. All right, so let's actually write, write out what this is in a little bit more uh, more detail here. I think I'm going to erase uh, well I, yeah, I guess I will I'll erase this because I want to keep my expression for intensity. Okay. So if I plug all this stuff in, 
Um, I guess I would want to write, yeah, okay, so, all right, so, so my intensity here for, for this, for the circular, circular aperture of radius A is going to become 2 over eta lambda squared z squared times the magnitude of this thing squared, so e naught squared. Um, two, two pi, two pi, let me write it this way, two pi over kappa squared, a squared, j1 of a k squared. Uh, a, uh, sorry, a kappa squared. I can even just write what kappa is here. Ah, no, I'll keep it. I'll keep it with kappa here, and I'll write. I'll substitute in the next, next thing here. Okay, so let's see. Two over eta lambda squared z squared e naught squared. All right, so two pi over kappa. This is. I'll, I'll plug in lambda here so that um, all this stuff cancels out. So the two pi's are going to cancel the. Uh, uh, two pi from here, and I'm going to just be left with. Uh, oh, I could I could just write this two pi times z over r times one over k, which is lambda over two pi. So that's where these things are going to go. All that squared, a squared, and then now inside inside of here, I'm going to have a times kappa. This is a times k times r over z, which is kind of the angle away from, r over z is the angle away from straight on. Uh, and you get, and, and this, is, this is basically it. Uh, I can kind of, uh, oh, I forgot to have a Bessel function here. J1 of a k. Um, you can sort of, Manipulate this a little bit more to get to get something that looks uh, looks slightly more symmetric, or at least something you can you can look up. Um, one of the I think the thing we're actually going to fit is is not involving lambda. It's it's involving the putting the k back in, and kind of multiplying and dividing by k. So let me just write that. I think I might have some room over here. So. And check that this is equivalent. This is probably what you're going to fit because this is the expression that you get if you look this up. Lambda over z times j1 of a k r over z divided by a k r over z. And uh, if you remember from, I don't know, sine sine of x over x is sometimes called sink, sink of x. Since this is a Bessel function, and the Bessel functions are kind of like signs that, that damp down, uh, this kind of Bessel function of x over x is sometimes called a jink, j-i-n-c. It's like this is a sink, sink of x. Uh, and this is what gives you the pattern. So this is just some constant out front. But this is what gives you the pattern that uh, as a function of of r starts off quite high, and this is intensity. Remember, so so it's this thing. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, this is the uh, I screwed up here. This is the electric field. So it's this thing squared. So uh, the electric field itself looks looks sort of like this, dying down as you go farther and farther away. And the intensity, of course, is the square of this. So that's going to look like a pattern that sort of goes like this uh, with only positive humps if you measure out in the origin. So this is the intensity. Intensity as a function of r. All right, and uh, and that is it. So so that is what we will 
fit in our lab is this vessel function. And again, you can ask Python, to, you can load a special functions module and just numerically evaluate the vessel function at various different arguments. Um, you, depending on how you do the fit and what you make your initial guesses, you may have to be a little bit careful here because if it tries to evaluate this at, at r equals zero, so at the very center of the spot, um, you're gonna end up with something, you know, something over zero. And uh, that you might think that that blows up, but just like sine of x over x doesn't blow up at the origin, this thing doesn't blow up at the origin. So uh, you, you may have to make special special accommodations for the origin, but I, I don't I don't think so. I think actually the if you sort of guess reasonable defaults, it it tends not to try to evaluate these functions at the origin. Okay, so that was it. That was uh, the end of diffraction. I know this section was a lot more mathematically heavy than certainly the stuff at the beginning of the class, maybe about as mathematically heavy as the coherence theory stuff where we were interfering waves of different colors. But this was, uh, this was thinking about a single color, but propagating in two dimensions. And in general, if you had some complicated light made up of multiple colors and you, you pass that through some pattern, you would have to break that light down into all the individual colors calculate the diffraction pattern for all those individual colors. And of course the, the dependence is in lambda and in K. So, you know, la lambda is secretly inside of K here. So um, the, as, as you make the light uh, shorter and shorter wavelength, the diffraction pattern tends to, tends to narrow, become narrower and narrower and narrower just because of this, this K dependence in, in the Bessel function. Um, and then at the end of the day, you would have to add up all of the different diffraction patterns. So if you were to shine white light through one of these holes, you often just see kind of a, a blurry mush of light because all the different colors tend to have peaks and troughs that all kind of uh, overlap and, and you don't really see the distinct pattern. Uh, but that would be uh, sort of the next, the next step would be to combine different colors with, with diffraction. All right, so I'm, I'm done with this. Next time, like I said, I'm gonna talk, uh, I'm gonna have kind of a, uh, a lighter lecture on some of the quantum, quantum optics stuff that you might end up being able to do in advanced lab when we're back in person next semester. And uh, we'll have our normal kind of lab office hour type session on Friday. And also next Friday, even though we will not have class next week or after this Friday, we'll be done with all lectures. And uh, I know that some of you are a little bit behind in the homeworks, and that's fine. I'm pretty, I'm gonna be pretty flexible about that with with COVID. Um, I think there are some homeworks that I haven't graded where everyone has finally handed in everything. So I will I will start to grade those starting in in the next couple of days and, and weeks. So uh, any other questions before before I take off and release you to quantum and release the whiteboard to its next user? If not, I will hopefully see you on Friday for the sort of more fun quantum optics lecture and uh, ask me lots of questions because I like answering questions. All right, bye.